Joab is an independent tech, tech industry analyst and technical product marketer working at TLA uh, Tech. And he is also a DevOps coach, CTO, technical pathfinder a tech and a tech community builder and the author of the Digital First Events, a book available on LeanPub. I checked it yesterday. It's, it's, it's a very nice price, actually. Um, so the picture you see here on screen is me as a freshly minted CTO. I was CTO for about three weeks, and I had to give a presentation to about a 1,000 of my coworkers. Um, and as you can see, I'm wearing, you know, a pretty nice uh, pants, good shoes, nice shirt. Uh, but I felt like a complete imposter. I had created some kind of vision that I was talking about. Unfortunately, I can't show it to you. Um, but I did add some thoughts that I had on stage there. I still can't believe they're letting me do this. They're totally on to me. They know I'm a fraud. It's only a matter of time before they find me out. So this was my feeling, and this is, I don't know, like uh, seven or eight years ago, a little while ago. Um, but this is always how I feel. I have no idea what I'm doing, right? So hi, I'm Yoop. I'm a total fraud, and I have been since 2006. So this is also me on a stage. This is um, even more years ago. Um, when I failed out of university, I uh, wasn't successful in my studies. I found a part-time job at a uh, nice little IT company that I thought, oh, this is okay. I like it here. Um, and to kind of compensate for not being successful with my studies, I failed out of university. I thought, okay, let's do all of the training courses that this company offers. And so I did. In 2005 and 2006, I did, I don't know, like 40 different courses just because you know I was overcompensating. I didn't know what I was good at. I just failed um, university. And so this is kind of the start of my career, not knowing what I was good at, failing at university, not having a degree, and then thinking, okay, let's just do whatever. Let's do let's just do stuff. Right. And so uh, I was working at a um, community college back then. And so they always needed models for their hairdressing. Um, so that's why I have a red mohawk there, uh, and I've had all all sorts of mohawks, uh, just as a as a side note. Um, and it's kind of weird because I uh, am part of this very cool group called Tech Field Day. I'm a VMware certified design expert, which is pretty exclusive. It's like an architect level certification. Back when VMware and data centers were still a thing, it's no longer really hip and happening of course, but it's uh, it's something I did. It's very exclusive. I've been a CTO for three years for a company of 1,200 engineers. I'm running my own successful company now, TLA Tech. Um, and if you wonder what the TLA stands for, don't worry, it's just a three letter acronym. Um, and you know, the company's doing well, I'm successful, I'm having fun, and I still feel like a failure, which is weird because, you know, I've done successful things. There is me giving presentations and you know, interviewing people and being interviewed and being a co-host on some cool, like a, a, a um, an interview format back when physical events were a thing. I interviewed, you know, the, the CEO of VMware. I talked to a bunch of cool people. And so the, the funny thing is I've done things, I've been successful, um, but it's not how I feel. It's not what I feel. I don't feel successful. And so that's weird. I mean, this is this is not how to disappoint an imposter, by the way. You know, uh, saying that the, the talk that you want to give about imposter syndrome has been declined a bunch of times. It still happens to me, by the way. This is um, you know from a couple of years ago, but it still happens. And so the weird thing is, I mean, I don't feel successful all the time. I feel like a failure a lot of the time. But am I a failure? Am I objectively a failure? I don't know. That's you know that's why I'm giving this talk, right? And I think the feeling I have, feeling like a failure, even though I do things and I'm successful at some, and you know I'm not successful in others. But I think the feeling that I have of being an imposter, of being found out, of being you know something that is someone who is not successful, I think everyone has that feeling once in a while, right? So I think there's 
broadly three categories of people. Um, people who get imposter syndrome like me, and then there's other people who also get imposter syndrome. And then there's literally everyone else. They also get imposter syndrome. And maybe not all the time and maybe not as heavy as I do sometimes, but everyone feels like a failure or everyone feels like an imposter sometimes. And, you know, that's okay. That's that's my message to you today. It's okay if you feel like a failure. It's okay if you don't succeed at some stuff sometimes, right? Um, and, and look at this guy. This is Mike Cannon Brooks. Uh, he's the founder of Atlassian. He's also the guy that challenged uh, Elon Musk years ago to build a big battery somewhere in Australia. Uh, and um, he said, okay. And then Elon uh, actually said, okay, I'll, I'll do you one better. I'll build it. And if I don't complete it in, you know, what was it, like 100 days, I'll give it to you for free. And um, I think that's what happened, but I'm not sure. Anyway, this guy is super successful. He runs a cool company, Atlassian. Maybe you've heard of it, Chara. Um, and he feels like a failure pretty much all the time. Um, and he gave a TED talk about this. Uh, by the way, whenever you see the big TED logo on screen, that's actually me referring to a TED video. I'll have the descriptions at the end of the presentation um, so you can actually go and look out for them. But this one kind of opened my eyes years ago um, because this what guy was successful. He runs a very large, very successful company. He does stuff his own way. And still he feels like a failure. So I thought, okay, there's some truth in this. There is, you know, I'm not the only one, right? So I, I talked to a bunch of people. I figured it out that, hey, there's a thing called imposter syndrome. And so the way I figured it out is basically by talking to a bunch of people, asking a bunch of questions. So I want to do the same. So in your own home, sitting in your laptop or wherever you are, um, raise your hand physically or mentally if, you know, if it's weird to actually raise your hand, but keep it raised if you've raised it once. So for instance, do you tend to chalk up your accomplishments to luck or timing? Well, I do. So I'll keep my hand raised, right? And so the next question is, do you hate making a mistake or do you hate being less than fully prepared or do you hate not doing things perfectly? My hand stays raised because I, this, this is true for me. And so do you fear feedback or are you crushed by even constructive criticism? Do you live in fear of being found out, discovered, fired, whatever? Do you think you're uh, not worthy is, is basically the question. So if you raised your hand somewhere along this quiz, uh, welcome to the club. There's many of us imposters out there. Um, I think everyone feels like an imposter at some point. Um, maybe I do feel that a little more than others. But what is imposter syndrome? So for me, it's super simple. My internal measuring stick that I measure myself with is just broken. Um, with more fancy words, because I did study at university for a little while, the incorrect assessment of one's abilities compared to peers or the inability to internalize accomplishments or the notion that others are more accomplished than you. I compare myself to others constantly. In, in you know, dealing with this, but also talking about this is a concept of pluralistic ignorance. And so I, I think many of you know the emperor's new clothes, which is a fairy tale where at some point the emperor is naked and everyone stands there saying, hey, beautiful clothes, emperor. And so pluralistic ignorance is basically the, the background of this image. We all have opinions, doubts, um, convictions, whatever we think. So uh, you see green, green brains here, you see blue brains, uh, brains, red, etc. But the imposter syndrome or pluralistic ignorance draws a circle around every brain, forcing every brain, brain to be orange, to have an orange opinion. And so what do you see? If you talk to people, what do you hear if you talk to people? Orange. Everyone is saying orange. You know, and that could be everyone is saying, hey, I'm doing super well. Look at me being very accomplished and successful, blah, blah, blah. What you don't see is all of the doubts and all of the fears and all of the limiting beliefs that people have. Those are the actual colors of the brains in this picture. But because no one is talking about it, no one knows about it. So... Uh, projecting that into imposter syndrome, 
pluralistic ignorance is doubting yourself privately, believing you are alone in thinking that way because no one else voices their own doubts. And so everyone is doubting, but no one is talking about it. And this is, problem is made worse in my experience because we all work in IT. We work as developers, as engineers, as whatever. Because in IT, everything is an opinion. And this may sound counterfactual, um, but is Kubernetes the best thing ever? I don't know, maybe Docker Swarm was, or Mesos for people that go back that long, or you know, maybe uh, containers aren't the best thing since sliced bread and virtualization is. Heck, I started my IT career doing Novell. For people that remember NetWare eDirectory, I started in IT in around 2004, 2005. Um, Novell was the thing. And then, you know, something else came and something else came and then VMware came along. And I thought that was, you know, factually the best thing ever. So I did a lot of VMware and now it's cloud and it's um, cloud native and it's development. But everything is an opinion. There is no one way of solving a problem. Everyone develops their own way, right? Everyone has their own opinion. And there's no big group consensus on how to do things. It's just so detailed, everyone has their own little mechanisms of solving problems, right? No single one way of doing stuff. And this problem is made worse by the Dunning-Kruger effect, um, where people that know a lot know they don't really know a lot, and people that don't know a lot think they know a lot. That's uh, the most complex way of explaining the Dunning-Kruger effect. Um, but really what happens is people that have the experience know they don't know a lot, right? And people that don't know a lot, they're inexperienced, they think they know a lot just because, you know, hey, I've learned, you know, this little piece of, of information. Now I think I know everything. Um, and in, again, in IT, this is made worse uh, because of the moving goalpost. So, you know, when I started in IT, it was Novell, then it became VMware, then it's, you know, Cloud native and Kubernetes and, and AWS, et cetera. And so the goalpost keeps moving constantly. There's no single way of doing things right. In effect, no one knows if the thing they are doing and the way they are doing it is actually the right way. And so that's great if you wanna have uh, doubts about yourself, hey, am I, am I doing it the right way? Because everyone's used to very internally think about, you know, this is how I solve problems. But it's all a matter of perspective. Um, so this is Earth, that little pale blue dot. And that's us. You are there. I am there. But what you can see is the struggle that each of us go through. Our own struggles, our own doubts, our own fears. So if you look at it from a distance, eh, everything is fine. If you ask me in a social conversation, hey, you, how are you doing? I'll say, I'm fine, I'm great, I'm good. I won't talk about my doubts and fears immediately, right? So you can't see my struggle. And I can't see your struggle. Again, this is pluralistic ignorance. We don't talk about our fears, our doubts, our struggles. Another way of looking at this is, is by using the NLP communication model as kind of a, a reference where basically there's, in between you and the world, there's something called a filter. And they distort the way you look at the world. So for instance, I love chopping down trees. That's one of my hobbies. I have a bunch of wood in my garden. I have a wood stove. I love wood. So when I see a tree, I see its potential to be chopped down, you know, um, um, chainsawed into smaller bits. And then I, I have fun with... Um, with an axe, basically. That's you know, that's my perspective. But a an artist working with wood will see something very differently. They see a potential to create some beautiful piece of art with it, right? So that's a filter. Um, this is a very innocent example, of course, but there's many different um, filters that each of us have. Um, and I like to call them "you are crap" filters because a lot of them will uh, have you know, will make you criticize yourself more harshly than you would criticize someone else. You are your own worst critic because of one of your filters. And these filters are built up, you know, in your uh, youth. When you grow up, 
uh, as you work, as you do. It's, it's just a part of who you are. So there's not a lot you can do about it, but there is a lot that you can do to figure out which filters you have. In other words, you can recalibrate that internal measuring stick, that internal ruler, and then kind of work your way from there. Because there's an end boss in this story. Um, like in, in a Mario game, there's an end boss. It's, uh, it's a pretty tough one. I haven't beaten it yet, but it's there. Right, so basically what, what you um, start doing is you start recalibrating the way you see yourself and the way others see you. And you bring them back into balance. So for instance, I think I'm a failure, right? Big circle, I think I'm a failure. Uh, maybe you do too, because I couldn't share my screen earlier. Uh, I mean, it, it happens. But in a general sense, I think people don't think I'm a failure. And still that difference is there. I feel like an imposter. Other people think, hey, that Yuke is a pretty great guy. Hopefully, I mean, maybe not. And so you have to recalibrate your internal, what you think of yourself versus what other people see. Hi, we are Ethicode and we organize the DevOps conference. DevOps is not a role. It's a way to increase an organization's ability to deliver applications and services faster with better quality. Some people say that DevOps is a management science. If Agile and DevOps are not yet part of your whole organization, we would love to have a chat and discuss how to make it real for you. You can find us at ethico.com. The links are in the description. And have a great time with the DevOps conference talks. So you can do a couple of things. You can sing this song very loudly every morning. Um, for those that actually know this song, it's, I mean, don't, I'll, I'll have to remove my earbud if you actually start singing, right? It's, it's horrible. Only Sinead O'Connor can sing this well. Um, but singing nothing compares to me every morning uh, is definitely a way of um, fixing your internal ruler. It's not the most practical. It, it, won't be the most successful. But having a mantra that says, hey, I'm not as bad as I think I am, it, it helps. Because you have to reprogram yourself to basically um, fix that the way that you see yourself. And stop comparing your blooper reel to everyone else's highlight reel. So social media sucks for one reason and one reason only. It's people try to be you know, portray themselves better than they actually are. Uh, and that plays into imposter syndrome because I for sure cannot do whatever that guy on the left is doing. Um, I probably look like the right. And I bet most of you do too. Like, so stop comparing yourself, like your entire being with someone else's highlight reel, someone else's social media post, whatever. Um, and not just social media, but just everything. Like, don't compare yourself to that coworker that just got a promotion because that's unfair. That's not that's not an apples to apples comparison. That's apples to oranges. Another way of of dealing with how you um, recalibrate that internal ruler is by fixing the way you deal with compliments. So chances are, and, and I'm not saying this is absolute. Uh, this won't apply to everyone, but chances are that if you receive a compliment, you immediately think, sure, 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 sure. That's not true, whatever. Um, nice try, dude. Um, when really you should be doing this, write them down, you know, a compliment and your accomplishments. Like I have a list somewhere. It's It's been a while since I wrote something, but I have a list with accomplishments. I have a list of things that I'm proud of. And I have a list of compliments that I received. I look at that list every once in a while. And then I pick one or two and I brag about them. Uh, and not in a, and, you know, not in an arrogant way, but just to fix your internal measuring stick. So if you talk about something that you did well, then other people say, hmm, well, that's true. And then you say, oh, apparently it's true because I said it and no one else said it wasn't true. So for instance, I'm kind of proud that I was a CTO for uh, a couple of years for a big company. I'm proud that I now have my own company um, and, and it's doing well. So if you'll remember, I used those two um, facts earlier in the presentation and that was me bragging, hopefully, you know, respectively about my accomplishments, 
So I fixed my internal measuring stick. So if we were in person in a big room together, I would do an exercise now where we would give each other compliments and it would be super awkward. Um, but given that this is virtual, uh, just let it be super awkward without the exercise, right? Give yourself a compliment um, and, and just, it, it's awkward, I'm sorry. Uh, next time it'll be in person and we'll we'll do that exercise, right? So one of the last things I wanna give you before my time is up is another TED Talk. Tim Urban, I'm a huge fan of this man. Um, he once gave a TED Talk about the procrastinator's brain. And so basically in my head, I have these, these two, right? I have the rational decision maker and I have the instant gratification monkey. So nine o'clock this morning, I um, very rationally said, hey, let's uh, prepare for this presentation. And so the instant gratification monkey fired up YouTube and I spent an hour or so watching some Kubernetes documentary. Uh, it's super entertaining, uh, but it didn't help me actually prepare for my talk. And so the reasoning behind this in my brain is, uh, according to Tim, uh, at least, is if you don't do a task because you didn't have the time, because the instant gratification monkey um, distracted you, then if you don't, if you end up doing the task not well, then it's not really your fault. It's it's the fault of you not spending time, right? So it's it's a coping mechanism to kind of lead away from the fact that you're afraid of failure. Right. Um, so yeah, watch this talk. I have the uh, the panic monster behind me. It's it's kind of one of my uh, my mottos that the, the panic monster is always with me. So in in the TED talk, Tim talks about you know you have the monkey, you have the rational decision maker, and then five minutes before you go live on stage, the the panic monster comes screaming, "Ah, you're too late!" Ah. And so then in five minutes, you do everything that you were supposed to do three hours earlier. Um, and, and so the panic monster is just a, a big help for me to visualize and to remind myself of, okay, you, it's fine. Go spend the time on a task. Even if you then fail after spending all of the time, that's still fine. You'll be better next time, et cetera. Right? So that's, again, recalibrating my brain um, to not be distracted by the monkey, but to actually do the work, put in the effort, um, and, you know, feel the pain if you weren't successful. That's part of life. And so learn how others work and do, and let others learn from you. So pair programming, pair review, so not peer review, but pair review, pair programming. If you show someone else how you do things, what your line of thought is, how you tackle a problem, then you create a better understanding of how someone else could do it. And so talk about your failures, talk about how you did stuff, how you were successful. Help other people understand how you think so that they can help you with how they think. That removes that pluralistic ignorance problem that we talked about earlier. But you have to trust others to do that. And so if there's one thing that I wanna give to you in this presentation is saying, hey, you're not alone. If you have feelings like this, that's fine. You're not alone. Talk about you. Talk about this with someone you trust, someone you know, or if that's your preference, someone you trust but don't know. Uh, but it makes yourself at ease and recalibrates your own ruler. It helps remove your doubt, but it also helps others with their doubts and their fears. So talk about stuff, do public speaking, and, and not necessarily on the stage like I'm doing here, but just talk to people. Don't hide behind the curtains at social events. Participate, be there, have an opinion, uh, whatever that opinion is, and uh, talk about your passions, your interests, your you know technology that you work on at work. Um, so even if the subject that you are talking about is neutral, like you know a piece of technology or a, a hobby that you have, Talking about it helps you to maybe talk about your fears and doubts later. Ask questions, ask for advice, but communicate. So lastly, I will leave you with um, something that has helped me years ago, um, is find something that you can fuck up without consequences. So for me, it's cooking. I'm part of a, a group of people that enjoys to uh, cook a five course dinner every two months. Sometimes we eat takeout pizza because we failed. Um, 
so if you'll if you'll notice up here somewhere i have a drone that's my first drone that i built from scratch myself soldering um you know software programming um uh, and basically flying it breaking it repairing it flying it so my goal with this drone is to have zero days since the last accident um not so much with the wood stuff because you know those are different kind of accidents i don't really want to um bury a uh, an axe deep inside my leg for instance so you know it's different for the wood, wood stuff for the uh, the wood chopping and another passion i have is mono skiing so if you don't know what that is look it up on youtube uh youtube or whatever but mono skiing is uh is a big passion actually last week i went to friends i did some mono skiing uh, and it was great so i highly recommend you uh you find something that you can just do without consequences. It doesn't matter what other people think of it. It doesn't matter if you're successful with it or not. Just do something. Outside of work, it has nothing to do with work. So don't you know build a home lab or you know recreate AWS or whatever. That's that's not the thing. Um, and if one of the final ones that I want to give you, but is too big and too heavy really to talk about in this talk is identifying your limiting beliefs. Everyone has them. It's basically what's ingrained in your head that leads to those filters that lead to, you know, me feeling like an imposter. Um, start discovering what those are. So for me, um, it's something from my childhood. Of course it is, it, it always is. But if you want to really start digging into that, this is one of the last TED Talks, I'll, uh, this is the last TED Talk I'll recommend to you. Brene Brown uh, talking about vulnerability is, is one of the eye openers for me because it, it helped me to actually start talking about this stuff that's in my head and how I feel, which has led me to, at some point, not really having imposter syndrome anymore. Uh, I still have it occasionally, but not as bad as I used to. And it's all simply because I now have the courage to talk about the things that don't go well, about the doubts that I have, the fears that I have, the limiting beliefs that I have. And I have a group of friends, a social support network. Uh, I even have a coach, uh, like a mentor, someone I pay money to uh, to talk to. Um, and all of that helps to fix my imposter syndrome. So with that, I want to wrap up. I want to thank you for being here. Thank you for your um, attention. Uh, I would like to receive a compliment or two uh, at jpskaag on Twitter. Joop at telatech.io is my email address. Find me somewhere on the socials on this platform. Uh, give me a compliment. Um, maybe even give me a beer uh, at some point. I would appreciate that as well. Uh, but for now, I want to thank you so much for listening to me ramble on about my failures in life and how I kind of coped with them. So thank you so much. And until next time. Joe, we have a couple of questions to you. Yes. In the Q&A. So shall we quickly go through them? Absolutely. Sounds good. So the first one, how to come out from imposter syndrome and how to quiet the bees in mind later when there are no mm. long uh, and complex projects. Oh, that is nice. So how to, I'll start with the, the, the latter. So how to quiet the busy mind later, physical work. So I talked about wood chopping, right? So I have a, a garden and I have, I've always have an ax laying around. So if I'm bored, if I'm done with a project, if I'm done with work, I go outside and I just chop woods until my arms hurt. And so do something physical, get out of your head, L literally stop thinking, do something physical with your hands, whether you uh, destroy something like I do with the drones or with the wood, or whether you create something, get out of your head, stop thinking, go outside, just do whatever, do something physical. Um, the first part, Marco, is how to come out of, uh, how to say that you have imposter syndrome. I don't think you need to really. I think you need to start to realize, okay, where is my internal measuring stick broken actually? And then go do things to fix it, right? So for instance, for me, it was, I'm very perfectionistic. I want to do everything very well all the time. And so that was one of the reasons it got stuck with me, right? Why it was broken. And so I learned to do stuff fast, bad, and wrong. That helps me in my perfectionism. I just do stuff fast, bad, and wrong every time. That's my goal. And then it turns out, you know, 80% of the time, it's not fast, bad, and wrong. 
it's quick enough, it's good enough, and it's okay enough, right? So for me, it was dealing dealing with it like that. So don't come, you know, don't say I have imposter syndrome, hey, I'm you, but just start to work on that internal measuring stick. Any other questions in the Q&A? So one more question is like, how does the imposter simple, uh, symptom affect our ability to foresee our plan for career progression? and get uh, real footing on our career. So how do you see how this uh, blocks us? That's a good question. Um, so for me, it definitely impacted my career in a sense that I always thought that the next step was something I couldn't make, right? I couldn't be CTO. I couldn't be an architect. I couldn't be an entrepreneur running my own company. And so it, it's helped me back. Um, luckily for me, at some point, I always make the jump, but it, it always takes me longer than uh, than it has to, right? So uh, maybe I should have been an entrepreneur not three years ago, but five years ago, who knows, right? So um, it, if you're not careful, if you let this lead your life too much, it will definitely affect the timing of your career at least, but also maybe you will miss opportunities because of it. Thank you very much, Joab. Very good talk, and thank you for sharing your personal experience on this. I, I believe many many of us are actually sharing similar syndrome, unfortunately, or fortunately. You know, it just makes us better. Exactly. <laughs> thank you very much, and see you next time on our. Yes, conference. thank you all. Bye bye. Thank, thank you. You know, yes. Keep...